So, so far we've been talking about some of the prophets who came to the kingdom of Israel. But now let's talk about the kingdom of Judah. One of the most important prophets in the kingdom of Judah was Isaiah. Isaiah was a very holy man, and one day while he was praying in the temple, he had a vision. It was a very beautiful vision. His vision was of heaven. Okay? And in his vision, he had a vision of God sitting upon his throne with angels about the throne singing, Holy, holy, holy. You know the rest of it? Pat? Yeah. Good. The Lord God of hosts. Javon? Um, you added a wee bit. All the earth is full of his glory. would be enough for now. But you're right. Yes, you got it. Where do we read that every day? Luke? And our missile, what part of the Mass? Katie? Um, the preface. Preface? Yeah. Preface? Luke? At the, uh, when the altar boys ring the bell after the altar Right. And that's um, because the uh, priest is saying in Latin, what's the Latin for holy, holy, holy? Blue Joe? Uh, sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Sanctus, sanctus. Holy, 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 the Lord God of hosts, all the earth is full of his glory. Hosanna in the highest. Right? And um, we, every day, remember the vision that Isaiah had. Not only that, but there's another point in the Mass when we talk about Isaiah as well. You see, Isaiah was afraid that he, because he did not feel worthy to be having such a vision. He was a humble man, okay? But one of the angels came up to him and took a hot coal and pressed it to his lips, Okay? And that told Isaiah that, so let's just put that on there, hot angel, hot coal to his lips. That told Isaiah that his sins were forgiven, his sins were cleansed, okay? Because that's what you take, it's hot stuff, right? If you want to clean um, like baby bottles or pacifiers. You put them in boiling water because the heat kills all the germs. So that's what the angel was saying. The angel was pressing that hot coal onto Isaiah's lips and, by, and saying, you are cleaned. Okay? You've been cleansed. Okay? But in this case, it's not from germs. It was from sin. Right? And where in the Mass do we refer to this part of Isaiah's vision? Yes. Before the gospel, right? The uh, priest says, Allow me to worthily read the words of the Holy Gospel. Okay? Let my lips be cleansed. All right? Just like the prophet Isaiah's were cleansed by the holy, uh, the uh, hot coal, okay, being pressed to his lips. Those aren't the exact words, of course. But uh, every Mass, the priest says those words. Okay, because the priest is asking God to make him holy to be able to read God's word. That's going to come out of his mouth, right? Then Isaiah heard the Lord say, Whom shall I send? Okay. And Isaiah answered, Send me. Send me, Lord. He didn't even know... He didn't know where he was being sent or why he was being sent. But if God wanted it, Isaiah wanted to volunteer. Okay? 
God had a very special um, not just message, but a very special plan, a very special errand, so to speak, for Isaiah to, to run. It was more than just running an errand, though. He was going to spend a lot of time, most of his life, trying to make sure that the kingdom of Judah would repent and trust in God. They had fallen away, maybe not quite as completely and fully as the kingdom of Israel had. The kingdom of Judah was lucky enough not to have, and they have been a Jezebel, Okay, trying to kill off all of the priests. But, at the same time, false idols had arisen in the land. And so, um, the people also were beginning to be afraid because a lot of the countries that David had thrown off and they didn't have any problems with were gaining in strength again, the, the peoples around them. Okay, the e- Egypts and the... Um, uh, Assyrian Empire, we talked about the Assyrians and how they were eventually going to take over Israel. The Assyrian Empire was growing in strength again. And the people were becoming, in Judah, were becoming very afraid. And so they were starting to prepare to fight. So, Isaiah came with a couple of messages. Number one, return to God. Okay. Penance, repentance your sins, turn away from your false gods. And secondly, have faith in God, not in yourselves. Not just faith as in you believe that in the teachings of the church, so to speak, but you actually have have show your faith in your actions as well. Okay? So in this case, believe in the strength of the Lord. Not of selves. It would be through the strength of God that the kingdom of Judah would be saved, not from themselves, or they also thought, well, if some of these other countries are becoming strong, maybe we should join with another country. Okay, to help fight off. The Assyrians, or the Egyptians, or the Babylonians, okay? So Achaz was the king of Judah. And he did not listen. He decided to throw his lot in with the Assyrians. So he made a pact with the Assyrians. Yes, the very same bloodthirsty Assyrians who would eventually destroy the kingdom of Israel. Okay. Not only did he make a pact with the Assyrians, but he kept making... So he, he didn't listen to either one. He also kept making offerings to the pagan gods. He didn't listen to either one of Isaiah's warnings. Okay? So, Egypt invaded, yes. I'm sorry, uh, uh, or not countries. Strength, okay, so their the faith, they should believe in the strength of the Lord, not in themselves and not in other countries. That's what I meant by that. Achaz doesn't listen, though. He keeps offering sacrifice to the pagan idols. He makes a pact with the Assyrians because the Egyptians were invading. Instead of relying upon the Lord and the strength of the Lord to defend them, he decided to go to the Assyrians, the bloodthirsty, pagan, idol-worshipping, child-sacrificing Assyrians. Well, the Assyrians helped them to defeat the Egyptians. But after that, Judah paid a very, very heavy price to the Assyrians. The kingdom of Judah, okay, the Egyptians were invading the Assyrians and Judah defeat them. 
Judah is now heavily in debt, though. To Assyria. Judah now has to pay taxes and tribute to the Assyrians. And this was draining off all the money of the Israelite people and their goods and the stuff that they were making. Because if they didn't, the Assyrians were going to attack them. And they owed Assyria this debt because Assyria helped them to fight off the Egyptians. But things are going to change. Things are going to change. Isaiah does not stop prophesying. He does not stop preaching. And he begins to have an influence. His influence is upon the people. And when Achaz dies, he is not given a burial with all the rest of the kings. Because he was so wicked... And he did not listen. He was not buried with all of the other kings. But his son, Ezekias, had much more strength than his father. So often, one of the problems, and we, it's something that we'll talk about when you get older and we get into other classes and talk a little bit more about political science and governments and that type of thing, but it's good for you to have some uh, basic knowledge. One of the problems with what we would call a monarchy, and this would be a monarchy, meaning there's a king, one ruler who rules over a country, is that a monarchy in... Um, theory can be the best form of government because you have, if you have a really good king, if you have a really good king who has the interest of the people in mind, then it can be the best form of government because then the king can just get things done for the people and do what's right for the people. But a monarchy can also the most easily turn into a tyranny because all it takes is a bad king and all of a sudden you've got a tyrant and the people are all being oppressed and enslaved and taxed and tortured, Okay. Lots of times in a monarchy you'll go from a good king to a bad king. It's happened many times in history. This is one of the examples of however it went the other way. You went from Achaz, who was a very bad king, did not want to listen to the prophets, did not want to do what was best for the people by listening to the prophet Isaiah and, and uh, returning to God, to a good king. His son, Ezekias, was a good king. He was very brave, okay? And he was faithful to the Lord. And the first thing he did was restore the true worship. He restored the true worship in the land. Okay? He repairs the temple, which had been damaged and left in to fall into uh, ruin and, and was just neglected. Okay? So he repairs the temple. He, in the end, he destroys the false idols and temples. Destroys false. He, he did all of the right things. He didn't just do part of it, which sometimes was what was the fault of some of the men. Maybe they weren't bad men, but they weren't good because, you know, look what Solomon did, right? Solomon had the true worship, but then he allowed the false worship to come in at the same time, and he had problems. Hezekiah had none of that. He didn't just restore the true worship and allow the idol worship to go on. He also uh, rebuilt the temple. Or I shouldn't say rebuilt. He repaired the temple. It'll have to be rebuilt at a future time. It wasn't totally destroyed. And he destroys all the false, false idols and all the false temples. Okay? God rewards him with great courage. Okay? And he has, uh, wins many great battles. He doesn't have the weakness that his father had and that his father felt like the Israelites would not be able to defend themselves. 
Hezekiah knew that with God's help they could. He rebelled against the Assyrian rulers, won many battles. Okay. But now comes the moment of truth. The king of the Assyrians marches upon Jerusalem with his whole army. Well, the bulk of it anyway. He's tired of this little country winning these battles and fighting back. And he is going to destroy them. He's going to march to Jerusalem and destroy the city. At first, Ezekiah does what probably most of us would do. So, uh, Jerome, what would you do if you were the king? What would you do? Um, prepare, an army. prepare an army. Okay. So the first thing Ezekiah does, Ezekiah, he starts to prepare an army. What else would you do? If you were in Jerusalem, what would you be doing in Jerusalem? What do you think, Gabe? What would you do if you were the king of Jerusalem and a big army was coming and you knew they were coming? What would you do? Just get the army together. What else? Probably do um, Okay, we already said that. What else would you do other than just get an army together? You got a city. What are you going to do for the city? Protect it. Protect it. How are you going to protect it? What kind of things are you going to do? Set up gates and walls. Ah, good. Yep. Okay. He goes around and he builds up all the walls out. Okay. The walls had fallen a bit into ruin as well around the city. Remember, those walls had been a problem back when David was trying to invade the city. The walls of Jerusalem were a very important part of the fortification of that city. A very good defense. So he starts doing what men would do. Building up the army, repairing the walls. But then the Assyrian army gets there. And he realizes, oh, what have I been thinking? The Assyrian army is nothing like any of them have ever seen before. It is so big, he knows that there is no way, no humanly way possible for them to defend the city. He knows they're going to lose. If nothing else, the Assyrians could lay siege, slowly move forward, and with that many men, there's nothing that the, the men, the people of Jerusalem were going to be able to do. God showed Ezekiah his own weakness because he was having faith in men, in himself. And isn't that one of the things that Isaiah said not to do? Not just in other countries, but also in themselves. Who did they have to have faith in? Who did they have to have faith in? Monica? God. They had to have faith in God. So Ezekiah sees this army and he realizes his mistake. And he sends for Isaiah. Okay. And Isaiah simply repeats what he's been saying the entire time. I told you, Isaiah never turned away from what God told him to preach, the message God told him to give, which is why he was such a good messenger, because sometimes messengers might just get fed up, right? Uh, people don't want to listen, I'm not going to say it anymore. Well, that's what happened with Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah told them again exactly what they needed to do. Okay. That. The people must trust in God and not themselves. It sounds simple, but it's not easy when that type of uh, pressure is put on you. But as Achaius realizes his mistake, not only does he send for Isaiah, but when Isaiah gives him that message, as Achaius does exactly what he should do. He tells the rest of the people to begin praying, and he himself goes to the temple and begins to pray. He stops building up forts. He stops training an army and making swords and bows and arrows and getting all prepared. He says, everyone, stop all of that. And he says, stop. We need to offer sacrifice. We should do penance for our sins. We need to pray to God for his help. And he does, and he prays very hard. And God hears their prayer. That night, 
God sends one, one angel of the Lord. Not an army, not a host of angels, not a legion of angels. One. Yes. Oh, sorry. I was just confused. See if what? Um, if you're going to do a question and help me remember the angels. Oh, ah, okay. One angel of the Lord. And that night, that one angel of the Lord kills how many men, Luke? 100,000? Nope. How many? I'll give you the 100, but it's more than that. Jerome? Um, no, no, no. It's in the 100,000. Um, no, it's below. It's between 1 and 200. Rita? I mean, uh, Katie? Closer? Uh, Monica? That's what she just said. Jai, get closer. Patrick? Getting closer. Nick? Oh, right in between. What's in between that, Luke? Yep. 100. Well, it's not 1,000, but it's 185,000 Assyrians are killed by that one angel. Needless to say, the rest of the Assyrians, including the king, flee back to Assyria. The king is in such disgrace that when he returns, he's put to death. And without ever picking up their swords, shooting an arrow, or defending the city, God has protected the kingdom of Judah because they were faithful to him.